Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, please take a seat uh, if you can, but I think that the, the room is full, which is very good. But uh, in any case, uh, probably there aren't enough seats for uh, somebody. If you are sitting near an empty seat, please signal to one of the attendees that are standing on there. Yes, there's one there and a few other seats. And uh, so I hope that everybody enjoyed the concert yesterday. And uh, now we're moving from uh, music into uh, research again, but the theme continues to be the same that is inspiring the, the week, which is the understanding the movement of uh, large marine animals, also humans, and the insights we derive from that in terms of our understanding of the ocean and also uh, our understanding of the ecology and biology of these fascinating animals. So, uh, in this uh, event, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Mikan, who is a principal investigator of the Australian Institute of Marine Science and arguably one of the top experts in the world on sharks and coral reef fish. And uh, so, we're fortunate to have him with us to share uh, his insights on the ecology of the giants of the ocean and what he's learned by tracking uh, very large marine animals for, I was going to say many decades, but he's actually, <laughs> he's actually younger than I am, uh, in, in the ocean over, over, over time, over his career. So Mark uh, comes originally from New Zealand, and then he received a PhD in Australia, working on, a, on a coral reef uh, ecology. And he then moved on to Canada, where he moved from uh, very warm animals into very cold uh, environments. So he was working on cod in the eastern coast of, uh, of Canada, of uh, Quebec. I think you were stationed at Quebec. And then after some uh, cold water experiences, he decided to go back to the warm and then has developed a very successful career uh, working on coral uh, reef fish and also sharks all around the world. And uh, he is uh, now leading a number of uh, projects and networks worldwide, looking at uh, very large animals and endangered sharks all around the world with uh, uh, collaborators in the US, Australia, and also here. And Mark is one of the participants in one new project that uh, has been uh, launched at COAST, uh, which is part of the, an overarching initiative about sensors in COAST, and one of them involves developing a new generation of sensors to be able to track marine animals more efficiently. So Mark is, a, is a, a partner of Kaus and this is his second visit, so you will have opportunities to interact with him uh, in the future as well. And with this, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to welcome Mark to the podium and enjoy the talk. Thanks, Kaus. Thanks, everyone. Um, first off, just like to thank Carlos for the invitation. Thank you to Kaus also for the invitation to uh, work here for a little while at this absolutely fantastic facility that you have here. Um, part of my work involves uh, looking at megafauna and charismatic megafauna, you can tell there's so many people here. Um, it's a big project uh, working on megafauna, it involves lots of people and the list of uh, people on the screen here is just a small fraction of the actual number that over the last decade or so I've had the privilege of working with in Australia, looking at whale sharks. Now, it's a really interesting little paradox that uh, whale sharks, like um, baleen whales or basking sharks that we see here, so for those of you who don't know, there's a basking shark and we have the baleen whales up here. Some of the, w the largest animals, in fact, the largest animals that have ever existed on the planet, and yet they feed on some of the smallest food. In the case of these whale sharks here, this thing with its mouth open and ram filter feeding up in the surface waters, it's eating tropical krill. Now those things are about the size of your thumbnail, probably even smaller. So it seems a very strange thing. How does a big thing like that get around on such tiny prey? Well, the large body mass of these animals and the size of the prey obviously means they have to consume a huge amount of this food. And the problem is particularly acute for whale sharks because they live in tropical waters that are warm. Now they're poikilotherms, so their body temperatures are determined by the water mass that they live in. 
and they're living in warm water, that means they've got high metabolic rates, so that means they've got quite high, uh, high energy costs. They have to feed a lot of food all the time just to keep themselves going. Now here's how whale sharks do that. They open their mouths, the water is sucked in, and these plates lie over the tops of the gills. When you look in, zoom in on the plate, you'll see it's this sort of reticulate network, like a fine mesh, covered in fine hair. It pushes the plankton that comes in the, uh, in the mouth with the water down into a bowl of stand here where it's swallowed by the, uh, the animal. The rest of the food goes out, uh, the rest of the water, sorry, goes out and oxygenates the gills. So, if we're interested in, for in foraging in these animals and we, took, we're, uh, we want to know how much they eat and how they get around, having a biologging approach is really uh, the way to go. So lots of people have been looking, using biologging approaches to answer questions about energetics of animals and marine systems for a while. What I did was I teamed up with a, a bunch of group, a group of researchers from the University of Texas and Texas A&M University who'd been working on Weddell seals in the Antarctic. And they had this uh, instrument here, well, instrument here, that um, was a combination of video, audio, it gave 3D position of the animal, temperature, light intensity, dissolved oxygen. In effect, it's like having a little mini lab on the back of a whale shark. Now, that, using that biologging approach, we were able to attach these to the backs of the sharks. Now, you'll see here they're attached by a small tether. The tether has a corrodible link in it. So after being on the shark for about 24 hours, and here's the tag being towed, by, towed along by the shark, this corrodible link pops off, the tag floats to the surface, and we have a, uh, a satellite tag here that gives us a general position for the tag, and then we have a VHF transmitter here that uh, allows us to track it down. So we. Um, Putting a thing on the animal, of course, is one, uh, is one thing. Getting the tag back again is, of course, another thing. And so uh, it, it's quite an involved process. And we're working at offshore of, uh, of Ningaloo Reef, which is in at the top of Western Australia. So we managed to get a number of deployments. I'm going to show you a couple here um, where we recovered the tag, we got bat locks of great video and stuff. And one of the things you first noticed about these animals when you looked at the video is that they had two very different uh, modes of movement. So when they're, uh, when they're descending, they're steady, they're gliding, basically. They don't kick. And when they're swimming along the bottom, you can see the swimming action from the camera. And the waggle on that camera is very useful because basically it waggles in time to the animal moving its tail. And what that means is we can turn a lot of the measurements we get out of that tag into estimates and uh, calculations about locomotion of these animals. So the tag just doesn't give us the environment around it. It tells us awful a lot about the locomotion and the, uh, the foraging animal. So here's some, uh, some plots of where that animal went and, uh, and how it swam, if you like. Here we have uh, Ningaloo Reef. The reef, is in, uh, the reef itself is the dashed lines here. And we've got um, depth contours off the reef. And the red track here and the blue track are two tracks of whale sharks, where we attach the tags here. 24 hours later, since they didn't go very far, only a few, you know, seven or eight kilometers, the tags popped off about 24 hours later. We recovered the tags, and, uh, and that gives you the, by dead reckoning, that gives you the track of the animal. Now, here we're looking at the track of the animal in a horizontal plane, right? Here I've changed it to look at the track in a depth plane. So we're looking, again, we've got distance here, but we've got depth on this side. And here we see the animal, because we've got a depth sensor aboard that tag, we see the animal going up and down in a water column. What I've done is I've actually color-coded the, uh, the uh, depth profile here, and I've color-coded them to show every blue dot is a time the animal took a stroke. So what we see is that the animal kicks up to the surface, but then glides back down. Kicks up, glides, and it does it all the time. Kicks up, glides, kicks up, glides. The other thing we see about the animal, so here's another part of that, um, 
of that uh, trace of the, of the same animal actually. I've color coded it here to, to show relative speed of this animal. For these big sharks, they swim incredibly slowly. They absolutely lope along. Now anyone who's swum with a whale shark can tell you while they look like they're swimming slowly, when you actually get in the water and try and keep up with them, which I imagine a few in the audience have actually done, it's quite an effort. Still, they are swimming very slowly for such a large shark. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of energy savings? Remember we've got a shark living in warm water, it's got to eat a lot of food, and its, its metabolic rate is relatively high. Well, by gliding, they're saving around 11 to 18 percent of energy compared to if they were swimming along with their mouth open just on the surface. Now, has anyone ever tried to, to actually pull a net along through the water column? You'll know it takes pretty much a lot of effort. Very, very quickly you get tired. Whale sharks get away with things by simply opening their mouth on a dive and just gliding down through the water column. So they get that filtering set effectively for free largely because they're slightly negatively buoyant, so they sink. The second thing is they're doing asymmetric dives. So a lot of the descents, a lot of the downward uh, descents on these dives are very slow, very gradual things. The ascents happen relatively rapidly. Now what that means is that the sharks actually spend a lot, a lot more time searching and, and filtering for food than they do in the energetically expensive um, ascent back to the surface. And the constant slow swimming, they swim at the optimal speed for minimising the cost of uh, locomotion per unit distance. And as I said before, that's an incredibly slow speed for such a big fish. Now overall, the foraging efficiency, that increases foraging effic efficiency by about 22 to 32 percent relative to them simply swimming along with their mouths open horizontally. Okay. So we've seen how they, a little bit how they forage at Ningaloo, and I apologise I didn't put a map in of where Ningaloo was, but this is actually Australia here, Western Australia, the top end of it. And Ningaloo is just on the elbow here, and that's where we're doing most of our work. So this is Indonesia up here. And uh, we're doing a lot of tagging work with these animals. So we've, I've just shown you a little bit of work on how they actually forage at Ningaloo, but that's only really half the story with these animals. They move a long distance. These things are big migrators. They only spend somewhere between March to June at Ningaloo, and the rest of the year they head off out somewhere into the open ocean. Our tagging studies, we've been using satellite tags to track them over the various years, shows that they're heading up to, uh, towards Indonesia and hanging around here in the Timor Sea. Another group of animals heads straight out towards into the open Indian Ocean, out towards Sri Lanka. And, and another third of the animals heads up here into towards the Banda Sea in the area of the, inla the, um, the seas inside of uh, the Indonesian archipelago. Right, so what are they doing while they're out in the open ocean? So we've seen a little bit of a glimpse of their lives while they're in the coastal area. What are they doing out in the open ocean? Well, to get at that, um, these are the types of tags we've been using. This is a, uh, this is a pat tag or a pop-up archival tag. There's some really smart people out there making tags these days for animals. These tags archive, that you attach them onto the animal through the skin just in the same way as we did with the biologging tag. They stay on the animal for a pre-programmed amount of time and then when, the, uh, when you've programmed it in, maybe after six months or so, there's a burn wire in here that allows the tag to pop off and all the data that's stored inside it is then broadcast to uh, uh, sent to a satellite. So you can sit at your desk when these things pop up and watch all this data being downloaded to you for what the whale shark's been doing for the last six months. That's a pretty cool bit of technology. They record temperature, they record depth, they record light levels and they have a clock on board. And from the, uh, the timing, from the, the quality of the light that they record and the clock that's on board, we can actually calculate latitude and longitude with some inaccuracies, but it's an amazing way that we can actually get the position of these animals. Here's another type of tag we've been using, and this is a uh, toad tag, a splash tag. And of course the problem with any of these big animals is you can't exactly catch one to attach a tag. Most other people who are tagging fish do exactly that, right? 
They catch the animal, they, they tie it down, even with really big sharks like white sharks, they tie it down and they attach the tag to the animal. We can't do that with a whale shark. So how do you tag one of these things? Well, this shows you how. So at Ningaloo, we operate out of these small boats and we have a plane that flies overhead, that silhouettes the shark, directs us over towards it, we jump into water, and here's the uh, whale shark. So we used a powered gun that actually attached a buckle to the shark, a uh, dorsal fin there, and that towed the tag along behind the shark. So from, that, um, from those various deployments, um, we, I'll, I'll just talk about this particular one, which we deployed at Christmas Island. Christmas Island's an Australian territory, even though it's uh, here's Ningaloo where we were before. Here's Christmas Island. It's an Australian territory. It's quite near to um, Indonesia. And the whale sharks turn up there every year around Christmas, actually, because there's 30 million land crabs that live on this tiny island that come down to the water to spawn. And that massive larvae and eggs that is a, is a primary source for these whale sharks to feed on. So it, it, it actually acts as a big whale shark beacon, if you like. So we managed to tag a couple of sharks that were at Christmas Island, and this is the track they went on. Over about four months, this shark swam almost all the way to the Pacific Ocean, got to the bird's head here in uh, Irianjaya, Papua, West Papua, turned around and came back. And the tag fell off somewhere near West Timor there. Now, I knew the tag was floating because this particular type of tag gives you depth and temperature readings. And because I knew that the, uh, in addition to location, so I was getting a whole lot of location uh, data that told me that the tag was at the surface, so it had come off the animal. And it was floating along here, outside, and I knew, I knew it was floating and probably going to wash up somewhere on, uh, on West Timor. So I got my graduate student to get on a plane, Conrad Speed, and uh, rush across to, um, to West Timor to try and recover the tag. Now before he could, this guy here, who was out walking this beach, picked up the tag and took it home. <laughs> so there's his home. So I was able to tell Conrad, you want to go to the third house just behind the soccer field and knock on the door there because that guy's got our tag. So, which is exactly what Conrad did. Um, of course, we gave the guy a reward for the tag. And um, there's a bit of a story about it, but um, the relatives actually chased Conrad and his driver out of town um, when they saw the money change hands because, uh, unfortunately, this guy hadn't arranged to give them any. So. Um, Fortunately, we made it back, we got, the, uh, we got the data out of the tag, and it was a gold mine. It's a gold mine because these tags, um, although they're expensive and they have reasonably large batteries in them, they still, the, the bandwidth to satellites is quite limited. So they only ever upload a summary of your data. Inside that tag is a much more detailed record. In fact, a, a really, truly a gold mine of data that's inside the tag. And here's what some of that data looks like. So we have multiple days across here. And what I've done is I've just hatched in the night. So we got day, night, day, night, etc. And we're looking here at the depth profile of the tag, of the shark, and its diving patterns through the day and at night. There's some interesting contrasts come up when you look at that. So I'll just pull it up a little bit closer so you get a bit of a clearer view. Now, during the day, we have the animals spending quite a considerable amount of time on the surface and then going down to around 400 to 500, well actually somewhere between 300 to 500 metres during, uh, during the day, coming back up, sitting at the surface, down, whereas at night the animals tend to spend much more of their time, a lot less time on the surface and a lot more time around the 100 metre to 200 metre mark. So we've got a quite different pattern of diving day versus night. So why is that? Well, here's that same data set um, plotted in a, different, in a different sort of way. I've just collapsed everything onto a 24-hour cycle down the bottom. Here's the night and here's the day. And what we see is the, these, are, these points are color-coded for the amount of time the whale shark's actually spending anywhere. So on the top we see that the red means they're spending an awful lot of time at the surface and then making these occasional forays down to 200 to 400 metres at night they're back at the 100 metre mark and a lot less time on the surface. Now that exactly mimics what the plankton is doing out in the open ocean. During the day, 
the plankton's heading down here. It's hanging out around the, uh, the 300 to 500 metre mark and it's called the deep scattering layer. At night, that plankton heads to the surface and hangs out around the thermocline, which is at 100 metres. So what it appears those whale sharks are doing is they're following that same diurnal uh, vertical migration of the food. That's what they're going up and down, up, down during the day, up during the night. And the satellite tagging is showing that a lot of sharks, this is actually typical of a lot of these whale sharks uh, traces we're getting back. In fact, it's actually typical of quite a lot of, uh, of open ocean animals. Things like tunas and billfish also do the same sort of thing. But for whale sharks, they're kind of different, right? They go down there and they have to filter their food. So they're passing a lot of water over the top of the gill. Now the water structure in uh, open ocean isn't uniform. It's warm at the top and it's colder as you go down. So we've got this warm water shark, this warm adapted shark, that heads down to the bottom during the day, down towards the 300 to 500 metre mark, starts filtering a whole lot of water across the gill that may be actually 20 degrees cooler than the water it gets at the surface. So is there, does that create a problem for the shark? Well, some work we did with Michelle Tums actually suggests that it does. It, it has a physiological cost, right? These sharks, when you look at the mean minimum dive temperature for about, the time they then spend at the surface is actually strongly correlated. So if, the, if they're going down, they're getting this cold water at the bottom where they're feeding on it, then they're coming back up to the surface and they're spending quite a long time at the surface probably to warm up. So there's evidence that these things are actually basking at the surface to try and warm up. And for these sharks, the, cost, the whole cost is exacerbated by the fact that when they're feeding down in deep, when they're getting down there, they're just gliding. So they're not producing a whole lot of energy, or a whole lot of heat in the muscles, right, that they could possibly use to warm themselves up. They're just slowly swimming and slowly gliding down there. So whale sharks have got this problem then. They want to stay warm. They want to feed, they want to feed in an energetically inexpensive way. But, they, but, but how do they do that? So it's to, to understand that, it's necessary really to look inside a whale shark. And today in China, um, unfortunately, that's all too possible. Um, here's a shark that's been fished out of uh, southern China. And fortunately, we can put at least some of this to good use because we can see how a whale shark is structured inside its body. Right. You start out with actually a layer of denticles, this grey um, surface on the top here, the shark skin. It's composed of two layers. Layers of denticles, um, which are a hard, so it forms a sort of a suit of armour for sharks, basically. And under that, we have this connective tissue, very thick connective tissue. Now, you know, may notice I've been spearing things into the skin of sharks. Well, in this case, it doesn't cause whale sharks much harm at all, because basically they have, one of their main defensive things is this connective tissue layer. Um, and it's not very well uh, vascularized or innervated. So it doesn't, doesn't uh, bleed a lot and it doesn't cause a lot of pain to animals. But just directly under that, we have all this red muscle. Now the red muscle, this thin layer here, is the muscle they're actually using for routine activity. So kind of like a chicken, right? Lots of white meat and very little red meat. Under that, we have these massive blocks of very poorly vascularized, um, uh, muscle, essentially. So there's very little blood flow through those huge blocks of muscle. All the blood flow is happening through this red muscle here on the outer, outer surface. Underneath that, we've got the liver. So it's a little hard to distinguish perhaps from the sore, which you can see going through here, but here's the lobes of the liver, right? And that's rich in oil. So it's packed with oil. It's the major buoyancy organ for the animal. You can see another slice through here looking at this other side, you can see where that liver is lying right across the body cavity. So what we'd argue here is that we've got two opposing selective forces. What we think is going on with these animals is that they've got a body plan that's actually adapted for thermal inertia. They keep the muscle that requires the most blood flow, remember that goes through the gills, they keep that away from the body core. They keep the body, then they keep it on the dorsal surface of the animal so that when they come up to bask, it's the first thing that heats up. 
And the thermal inertia that's, uh, that's associated with mass explains the enormous size of these animals. Now the largest, um, I've been a bit dyslexic on that slide, I see. The largest one is actually 34 metric tons, not 43 metric tons, and estimated to be over 17 metres long. But at that size, they're as big as um, many of the baleen whales, say humpback whales, for example. Um, they're, they're easily in the same size range. So the selective forces we've got here are the scarcity of prey, and these are ligotrophic tropical warm oceans, and the need for this cost-effective foraging, right? And they've got the counterbalanced by the fact that they're using a gill to filter feed in the deep, cool waters of the open ocean. And they're getting around that by spending a fair bit of time on the surface basking. At least that's the argument we're making. Who else has done, used a similar sort of uh, uh, life history strategy? Turns out that there's actually quite a few animals out there that do it. And um, leatherback turtles are a classic. They do exactly the same thing. The largest sea turtle, they get absolutely enormous. And in, in the past, during the Mesozoic, Gigantothermy was one of the key things that pe uh, people have argued that the uh, dinosaurs did to, uh, to attain these, these sauropod dinosaurs that attained some of the largest sizes of any terrestrial animal that ever existed. And it's, uh, it's argued that gigantothermy in these animals was a key, key feature that allowed them to get so big. So, it turns out that whale sharks in contrast to, to tunas and laminid sharks, they use a very, they achieve the same goals, but essentially by opposite, opposite means. You've got the whale shark that collects all its uh, vascularized tissue, its red muscle on the outside of the body, compared to the tunas and laminid sharks, which actually have special heat exchanging uh, rets in their blood system that exchange uh, temperature, warm, warm temperatures generated by their fast moving muscles, they exchange that heat with the cold incoming blood so that they essentially maintain their body temperatures at much higher than ambient. And both laminid sharks and, uh, and skipjack tuna do that. Because they're fast swimming predators, they have that ability, they have, uh, they have that option. Whale sharks take the slow lane. They take the big lane, but they certainly take the slow lane as a, as a different option. Okay, so if they're using gigantothermy, what does that actually mean for the general ecology of these sharks? Well, essentially, it suggests that if you're going to use size as a means of getting around your costs of diving out in the open ocean, the cost should actually be highest for juvenile animals. It's really interesting then that when we go to these aggregation sites um, that occur in coastal waters, just like the ones here in Red Sea or anywhere around the Indian Ocean, many other places in the Pacific Atlantic as well, the animals that are in those aggregations are all juveniles. Now, that may be coincidental, but maybe not, because certainly for juvenile animals, the, the cost of, uh, of heat loss is, is actually highest for them because of their relatively high surface-to-area body weight ratios. So what we suggest is that what these animals may be doing is coming into shallow water to feed on these reef areas as a means of escaping the metabolic costs of doing that out in the open ocean. Now, you can, you can feed on in the inshore, but that also opens you up to certain, uh, certain risks. And it's kind of interesting that these sharks don't turn up in these aggregations till they're around three to four metres in size. And that's about the same size as the largest predatory sharks that you'll get in these areas. And those include, of course, at Ningaloo, white sharks and tiger sharks, both of which uh, you, know, you, can, uh, you can run into there. And whale sharks, despite their size, still get bitten by things. This is a whale shark we found at Ningaloo uh, a few years ago. And this is the really interesting photo on this side. Um, you've got an old bite by a big predatory shark. It, you can see it's old because the edges are kind of rounded. You can see where it's healing. It's got three attacks on it, mind you, so that's the first one. The second one are these round holes here, which are actually done by cookie cutter sharks. Now, cookie cutter sharks are a small kleptoparasitic type of shark. That means they steal things from other, other animals out there. Essentially, they run around, they've got a pair of jaws like a cookie cutter, and they suck onto whales 
uh, seals, and they twist themselves around, they pull out a chunk of flesh, just like a cookie cutter, hence their name, right? Um, normally, they probably wouldn't be able to attack a whale shark, but because the other shark has opened up such a large hole, it's uh, allowed the cookie cutters to get in there and get stuck into this poor shark. And then, we've got a third attack on the shark. We have a very large shark that's removed, essentially, the entire dorsal fin of this animal. Now, because we know the, um, the width of that, of that bite there, we can actually estimate the size of that shark that did that, which was around four metres long, so either a tiger shark or a white shark. And we know it was a shark because if we look on the other side of that animal, you'll see the sharks made an attempted bite here and left a tooth poking out. But don't feel too sorry for the shark because here we are two months later, and see how that wound is healed? Quite remarkable. The edges of the dorsal fin are starting to round up. It's still getting bitten by the old cookie cutter sharks out there, but it's well on the way to recovery. And in fact, here we are a year later. The pale belly skin has grown up around the uh, outside of the animal, so that's, that's entirely natural. The um, dorsal fin is healed over, and that shark has actually been seen at the Ningaloo aggregation since that time. They can clearly sustain a fair bit of damage. <coughs> So I'm just going to, I will move on to some other topics in a sec, but um, just at this point acknowledge the, um, the incredible support we've had from Apache Energy as a funder of this work and uh, the Department of Environment Conser Conservation formerly, it's now the uh, Department of Parks and Wildlife for state, state government. Um, so that sort of is part of the science part of this talk, but I think when you deal with these incredible animals, as I've been privileged to do so for the last 10 years or so, it's also incumbent on you to actually talk about their environmental status and the prognosis for the future of these animals. And there are, there are issues. Um, but before I do that, actually, what I might do is just show you some of the other things we got out of these tags with some really cool bits of natural history. Now, when you see a whale shark at Ningaloo, it's often accompanied by these massive schools of little bait fish that swim around the head of the shark. And there's lots of theories out there as to why that should be occurring. One of them is that um, the, shark, the small fish around the head of the shark are gaining some protection from being around that shark. This video shows why that theory is false. So here's the happy whale shark swimming along, and here we have the bait fish, little jack mackerels, and these are trevally or jacks. These are hungry jacks. <laughs> Unfortunately, we haven't got any sound. At this point, they're bumping into the camera. At this point, the whale shark's decided it really doesn't like this, and it's gone completely vertical and is heading straight up to the surface. So you'll see in a second, there's the sun. It's gone completely vertical. It's stopped now, so the camera, pretty we don't have the sound. You get a nice sound of the shark skin sliding there. And we see how many poor little fish we've actually got left. <laughs> not, not so many, unfortunately. Um, if I were to leave this video to run for another you know, few minutes or so, those jacks reassemble group the fish around and clean up every single one of them bar one poor little guy who's left on the head of the shark. You, know, you must be feeling pretty damn lonely by the end of it. <laughs> so um, back, to the, back to the sort of general biology and, and um, environmental future of these animals. Th these are really cool sharks. They changed the shark world um, by one of them in Taiwan was found, the only, they found a pregnant female. Now, Sharks have been around a very long time, right? Um, and they've had the time to evolve all sorts of bizarre reproductive uh, strategies. They can actually have virgin births. They can do parthenogenesis like some lizards. They, they, uh, some of them do uh, placental uh, pups, so they have a placenta inside the females that the pups are attached to. Others have um, a, a, actually have what's called ovoviviparity, or aplacental viviparity, where the, the, uh, the pup is inside an egg case, hatches within the female, 
and then feeds off a yolk, source, uh, yolk inside the female until it's ready to uh, pup and is uh, actually released out of the female, pupped. So that's, that's just three. There's actually a, quite a few more. In the case of whale sharks, it turns out only one ever pregnant female ever found, found in a Taiwanese fishery back in the early 90s, and she had 300 young inside her. And they were all in various stages of development, right, from inside the egg case, and the egg case you can see it here, and it's been broken open to show the shark, to little pups that were actually ready to go and free swimming, and they kept some of those in the aquaria. Remarkably, they're only 50 to 60 centimetres long. So they, there's some remarkable photos of these things in swimming in, in literally these guys' aquaria sitting on, on a desktop. It's quite amazing. Um, so we, we were really interested by this, and we actually went to uh, have a look at the genetics of these animals because we were interested to know how many dads did that 300 pups represent. Well... As it turns out, over the years, the Taiwanese had, um, had sort of had freezer breakdowns and stuff, and they 300 pups, and they'd thrown a lot of them away. And it turned out we had 14 of the things left in the end. They'd been frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed so many times in this freezer, they'd formed a solid block, which uh, Jennifer Schmidt called the pupsicle. So we, we, uh, we thawed that out and we're able to get 14, and 14 pups of different stages of development. Turns out they all have the same dad. So what that means is that these female sharks are, are probably able to store sperm. Um, and that, that might speak to, the, um, to the, the chances of finding a mate out in the open ocean. That if you do run into a boy you like, best, best keep a hold of a, a few memories. You know. um, the threats to these sharks are real and, uh, and possibly increasing. Uh, they've been fished in a number of different places around the world, mostly in Southeast Asia, a huge fishery that used to happen in, uh, in India. But uh, a lot of those fisheries have been banned now. Um, the problem is, though, that there's still quite a large black market out there, which we'll talk about in a second. And it's a black market because... These, these sharks actually are one of the priciest um, shark meat uh, resources around because they cook up into the, about the, all that white muscle and it cooks up to the consistency of about tofu. So they're called the tofu fish and they're quite popular. Um, big sharks, you know, you can get a lot of money from a big shark. Protected in lots of places, but you can imagine if you're a, if you're a small villager and you see one of these things sw swimming by your, uh, your canoe, the temptation to do this might be well, very well overwhelming. This is a lot of how the fishery happens through Southeast Asia. You have a small bloke in a canoe with a very big hook. They spot a whale shark. He leaps over, overboard and buries the hook in the uh, head of the whale shark that then tows the canoe around for a while. When a whale shark gets tired, you jump on the whale shark's back. And what that guy is doing, that somewhat blurry photograph, I apologise, but what he's actually doing is he has a parang, a bush knife, and he's soaring through the backbone of the shark so that uh, it can't kick anymore. Once you've done that, of course, you can uh, rig up the whale shark like this and tow it back home, stake it out on the reef flat for a few days, it'll stay alive, and while you organise the fish buyers with their fish boxes to come in and you just chop it up. Um, but one of the, probably one of the bigger threats that we've been alerted to is the fact that there's quite, it's... There's quite a demand, a growing demand in China for, um, for whale shark products. And so they actually have specialised vessels now that are targeting both whale sharks and manta rays. And you'd say, why would anyone want to eat a manta ray? Well, it turns out that the gill rakers inside the manta ray's gills are actually gr ground up into a powdered form. And the argument goes in Chinese medicine that because these filter the water, they will filter your blood. And so that's, they're an incredibly expensive product in Chinese medicine and there's a, big, there's a big impetus for people to go out and fish them along with whale sharks. So you, you not only have the products themselves, you also have the fins, the giant fins off these things. Now they don't actually contain a lot of material that you might use for shark fin soup. But restaurants do like to hang them in the window to advertise the fact that they're selling uh, shark fin soup. And even the local markets in Indonesia, this is a tail fin off a whale shark, you can find them, you can find bits of whale sharks for sale. Okay, so um, I don't really want to leave on that depressing note, but uh, um, that's it. 
Um, I think we all need to think about really, you know, the future of some of these big animals because even though things like whale sharks might have quite high reproductive rates, the threats out, out there are actually real and probably growing. Thanks once again to Carlos for inviting me to talk here today. And thank you everyone. Questions? Anyone got a question? No? Thank you, Mark. So <clears throat> we have some time for questions. Thank you, Mark. That was a really cool talk. Um, you gave some, some uh, indication for, for why the, uh, the aggregations might be biased towards juveniles. Um, do you have any insights into why the gender segregation might be occurring? Yeah, so um, lots, of whale, lots, lots of sharks differ in their juvenile growth rates. And I strongly suspect that um, if, if we look carefully at the relative growth rates of juvenile females and males, we'll find that males grow much, much faster. And, and that's one of the reasons. Unfortunately, the recent paper that's just been published on growth rates of whale sharks by the Chinese guys used a technique that um, gave very inaccurate counts. And we've shown that by um, getting some vertebrae from a large whale shark that was stranded in Pakistan a few years ago, looking inside the, looking inside the vertebrae where they have rings, just like trees, right? So you can count back and, and work out how old they are. And we looked for carbon released by the atom bomb in the atmospheric tests in the 60s and 70s. And that gave us a marker inside the vertebrae that, uh, that allows us to get in a precise age on that individual. That individual turned out to be 70 years old, and it wasn't that big. So estimates of these sharks growing, uh, you know, or being aged to maybe a, as many as 100 years probably aren't that far, aren't at all, you know, um, fanciful. They probably can get that old. In which case, you know, we're talking about um, even more vulnerability probably. Any other questions for Mark? I don't know if I should let Dan ask a question. I'm fascinated by the red muscle on the, on the periphery, which, as you pointed out, soon is something entirely different. But what do they use all that white muscle for? Do they, do they use that for swimming for short periods of time? So if I went back to that uh, slide where we had the tracks of the sharks, you'd see one bright red dot on the, uh, on the trace. So they do, on occasion, use all that stuff. And, and if you startle them, or on sometimes if you stab them with a pole, as we sometimes do, um, you, you can get that sort of reaction out of them, especially the small ones. In fact, the small ones are very, very wary of anyone approaching behind and below them. And that tends to be where big sharks will attack them from. So if you, if you approach one from behind and below, they will often skedaddle off at a great rate. They do use it, just not very often. Yep. Uh, are there any sources of stress besides humans that um, old whale sharks face? Uh, the the most the majority of it is all human problems, and the hunting is just one. Another one I didn't mention is ship strike. So um, the, the animals spend about 90% of their time during the day on this ocean surface, and that makes them very vulnerable to being struck by ships. In fact, um, during the recently one of the, I saw a seminar here which showed some information about, uh, about back in the 30s when uh, steamships first started plying the Red Sea. Um, quite a number of sharks were actually struck by them. And in fact, a guy called Dr. Gudger, who worked for, I think he was at Harvard, but he was a fish taxonomist. He made a career in the 40s out of recording these ship strikes because no one had ever seen whale sharks before. And occasionally, ships turned up back in port with the whale sharks strung across the bows. So it was quite an event. Anyway, this guy in, in the 1940s wrote his magnum opus, which was a, a paper entitled uh, Whale sharks struck by ocean vessels, how these sluggish leviathans contribute to their own demise, which, 
which says way more about the attitude at the time than it does anything to do with uh, whale sharks. You know, these poor old whale sharks, if they're too dumb to get out of the way, well, they deserve to go extinct, don't they? You know, which is kind of... Yeah. Approximately how many are there in the world? Good question. We don't know. Um, and there's some um, genetic data uh, that suggested uh, back in oh, what's the date of that paper, it's uh, 2008, um, that suggested something like 250,000 breeding pairs. But um, that, that the numbers are so rubbery, it's it's very difficult to actually put a put a solid number on that. The, the more places we look, the more we tend to find, actually. The number of aggregation sites around the world is, has actually been increasing. Um, but those are, of course, juvenile animals, and they tend to be more abundant than the adults, particularly you know, breeding adults. We don't really have a good handle on that. Yep? So, uh, whale sharks, is that only one species wherever you are in the world? Yep, uh, yes, it is. And, and why is that? Is there... Because there does seem to be quite a bit of leakage genetically um, through... Uh, through the populations. Uh, there's been three studies done now looking at the genetics, worldwide genetics of whale sharks. Um, basically, you can see a difference from the Caribbean stock, from the, so the, the Atlantic stock, from the Indo-Pacific. But across the Indo-Pacific, it tends to be quite a homogeneous um, genetic structure. And there does, it, that may well be because we've been using pretty much lousy markers and some poor techniques, but it, it's very hard to say what that actually means ecologically for sharks, for whale sharks, because you can get pan mixes from any number of ways. You can get it by one individual per generation, or one or two individuals per generation. One shifts from, say, an aggregation in Ningaloo up to one in Sri Lanka that shifts from one in the Red Sea that shifts down to Mozambique. And bingo, you've got pan, pan mixes or homogeneous uh, genetics. So. What that means in an ecological sense and how we actually manage these animals is, a, is another thing entirely. The other thing is that sharks have relatively low rates of uh, mutation and, uh, and these things, a generation for them, could be a very long time. So uh, they, they're a difficult thing to work on. In actual fact, what we're doing with them is we've started a study on their parasites uh, to look at the genetics of their parasites because they turn over much faster than the sharks themselves. So. Um, We've, we've just about just about completed that study now. Any other question for Dr. Mikan? Well, if not, before uh, we depart, just to uh, let you know that the enrichment program uh, offers a range of additional opportunities for you to learn more about sharks, about the Red Sea, and our marine environment. So this uh, evening at 5:30, there will be a science cafe at the library. And uh, led by or any question you may have about marine life in the Red Sea, you will have our top experts to address them. So the Science Cafe will be uh, led by uh, uh, Professor Burt Jones, uh, 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 Chris Bolstra, and Mike Berumen, who's uh, here. So please uh, join them at 5.30 to uh, share your interests and questions about Red Sea. Uh, life and the threats and conservation issues around them and also the library at the same time there will be an installation about jellyfish that's still ongoing and a poster exhibition about marine life in the Red Sea that you can also enjoy and that's not uh, the last of the activities because uh, also you the, many of the community members have signed up for a trip to the Jeddah Aquarium that will be led by Royal and some other members of uh, Mike uh, Mike Berumen's lab, so thank you, Mike, and Royal, for your contribution to the program. And also here, uh, we are running an experiment mostly engaging the uh, school kids and high school uh, uh, um, uh, students to uh, join us in looking at how animals move in the ocean. So a number of uh, scientists have made available to us data on animals moving around the ocean, and the community is now uh, being able to follow them. Uh, through files of tracking that we made available in the, in the website. So maybe you are involved, and if not, there's still time for you to uh, become involved and uh, be fascinated by the long trips that these organisms engage on. And, and I would like to acknowledge the participants of the Marine Megafauna Workshop that are with us here, including uh, uh, Dr. Mark Nikan, that have supplied those data but have also supported our program. And many of them are here, so I'd like you to stand up and 
be acknowledged, please. Yeah. So I, I keep them very busy, but if you stumble a, across them in the cafe or around the spine or something, take any opportunity you can to ask them about marine life because we have here in Kaos the top world experts on, on seals, on, a, on a large fish, on sharks, uh, whale sharks, and uh, all kinds of marine animals that you might be curious about. So please uh, feel free to ask them about their uh, insights about these animals. And uh, we have yeah, two more, two more uh, activities to wrap up the week, which are two movies. One is Moby Dick on uh, Friday, and the other one is Oceans on Saturday. Uh, they will be projected at the Discovery uh, Theater, and then there will be a discussion afterwards, so you can uh, also, again, uh, show up there and continue the conversation about large marine animals and how can we best conserve the oceans. And to just finish, before we thank again and acknowledge uh, Dr. Mark Mikan, I'd like to also request a round of applause for the enthusiastic team of the Enrichment Program that have worked very hard during six months to bring this exciting program to us. So, thank you. Thank you. But also a big applause for Professor Carlos Duarte. Managing the Richmond Brown will present uh, Dr. Mark Mikan with a memento from Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Good afternoon.